Okay, here we have the GCSE Combined Science Trilogy uh, Biology Paper 2 Foundation Tier Walkthrough. Uh, question 1 is looking at fossils and evolution and how things are related to each other. So figure 1 shows the photograph of a fossil of a trilobite. Um, the very first question asks us when were the trilobites alive? Um, if it's fossilised, it's going to have been millions of years, so none of these are long enough ago. It's got to be between 200 and 500 million years. Uh, 1.2 suggests how the fossil in figure 1 was formed. Uh, the organism will have been replaced by minerals. <coughs> Trilobites are extinct. Uh, what does extinct mean? Uh, the species evolved into another species. The species, the species does not have any soft tissue parts. There are no organisms of the species alive today, and there are not enough of the species alive to reproduce. Uh, the answer for this one is clearly there are no organisms of that species alive today. <clears throat> one point four. Hyoliths are another type of fossil. They were discovered in the 1800s and thought to be a type of snail. Uh, in 2017, scientists used modern techniques to place hyoliths in a different group. And the method they used, or the technique they used, was DNA analysis. Uh, which scientist developed the traditional classification system for all living, living organisms? That was Carl Linnaeus. And the next few uh, questions are going to be using this evolutionary tree, which essentially tells us um, which species were descended from which other species. So you can see the margin of cephalia, cephalia sorry, uh, was the common ancestor for all of these other dinosaurs here and the other one here. Uh, Suggest so which two of the dinosaurs are most closely related. If we have a look here, uh, these two are going to be the closest related because they came from the Coronosaurus. So we had Protoceratops, and I believe it was the Triceratops. Uh, next question asks us to name a common ancestor of the Triceratops and the Leptoceratops. What we have to do is look at our evolutionary tree. We're looking at the Leptoceratops and the Triceratops and we have to follow our tree backwards until we find a named common ancestor and it's the Marginocephalia. the margin of cephalia. There we go. Uh, how does the fossil record provide evidence for Darwin's theory of evolution? So Darwin suggested that um, the current complex um, organisms that we see today were, have evolved over time from much simpler organisms. So if we look here, older fossils have a simpler structure that agrees with what Darwin says. So we can give that one a nice big tick there. Question two is about reproduction and we just need to complete the sentences using the words in our word bank over here. So identical offspring are produced by asexual reproduction. So they only have one parent. These offspring are called clones um, because they only have DNA from one parent, so they've got to be identical to their parent. In another form of reproduction, male and female 
gametes, which is another word for sex cells, join at fertilization. This leads to variation in the offspring because you've got DNA from two individuals coming together. Uh, and once it's once it's formed, the embryo goes by a type of cell division called mitosis. Uh, question two, uh, sorry, 2.2. .2. The body cells of a kangaroo have 16 chromosomes. How many chromosomes will an egg cell of, the of a kangaroo have? Well, the, the gametes of any organism have half the number of chromosomes than the body cells. So 16 over 2 is 8. Uh, which sex chromosomes will be in the body cells of a male kangaroo? Uh, if you're male, your chromosomes are XY. Over here. If it were female, it would be XX, and these two are just red herrings, there are no Z chromosomes. <coughs> so here we have uh, some data about the number of chromosomes in the body cells of different organisms. So here we are, humans, we've got 46 chromosomes which exist in 23 pairs, and we've got a range of different animals here with different number of chromosomes. We also have a <coughs> graph here, a bar chart, sorry, of the different uh, species of animals and it's asking guys to plot the data from table one for the snail and the zebrafish. So we'll start off by labelling the snail uh, and it looks like there's a gap of two squares in between this heavier line and the left hand edge of the, the bar and the same on the right hand side. <coughs> So the snail is 24 high, so this is 20 and each div smaller division represents 2, so you're going to have to go up to this point here, again make sure it's symmetrical and you guys will be using a ruler obviously but I neglected to bring one, so I'll try and draw this as straight as I can, apologies. I believe that's 24. Next one is asking us to do the zebrafish. So again, two divisions away from the heavier line, this time all the way up to 50. And it's a lot easier if you do have a ruler. But your line should look something like this, only not neater. And We'll label that. You can shade it if you want, it looks a bit nicer, but not necessary at all. Uh, next, how many more chromosomes are there in the body cells of giraffes than in the body cells of animal H? And it's given us a nice big space here uh, to write down our answers. So we're going to look at our graph. Well, we don't even have to look at our graph, we can look at uh, the kangaroo, 16. I don't know why it's a kangaroo. The giraffe, 62. So 62 for the giraffe. And animal X, we will have to look at the graph for. So animal X is here. If we read that across, that's 32. So 62 minus 32 gives us. 30 and we'll write the number of chromosomes here in this space and we could just underline it there to make sure the examiner knows what to mark. <clears throat> the student concluded the bigger an animal the more chromosomes it has in each body cell. So there are a couple of things we can say to refute this, uh, reasons why it's not a valid conclusion. Firstly, it doesn't show all animals. So to make a statement like that you'd have to have tested every single animal. Uh, also, if we have a look at <coughs> the zebrafish, that's got 50 chromosomes, whereas the giraffe, which we can safely assume is much larger than a zebrafish, has 62. So we could cite that as, as an example. So zebrafish is smaller than, let's consider that, so <coughs> obviously it's, we can't use the giraffe as an example. 
sorry, because the giraffe has more chromosomes. So we can look at the kangaroo instead. Kangaroo is probably bigger than the zebrafish. That's got 16. Zebrafish has got more chromosomes. So zebrafish is smaller than kangaroo, but has more chromosomes. So either of these two will be fine. Okay, uh, question three uh, is to do with ecology. So in 2017, the City of Manchester began a City of Trees project and the council intended to plant 3 million trees over the next 25 years. Uh, the trees planted will make the woodlands larger, they'll make new woodlands and they're going to be in parks and streets and in people's gardens. So the first part of the question asks us how is it going to benefit the people? So this is a bit of a strange one, but I think we can do this by a uh, process of elimination. So uh, the first option is by dropping leaves on the streets in autumn. That doesn't sound like it's helpful at all, so I'm going to scratch that. That's not helping anybody. Hiding the road signs also sounds a little, sounds a little bit dangerous. So I'm going to scratch that one. Um, it's nice to have trees around, and I think they will help people relax in outdoor spaces. So I'm giving that one a tick. Uh, by putting sittings there, they can't really do that and that wouldn't really be helpful either. So I'm going to scratch that and that leaves us with by reducing noise pollution because they'll absorb noise from cars and things like that. So, get that. Next, how will it benefit the environment? So this is probably more to do with what you've been learning about in the ecology topic. Um, more space for car parks, that doesn't sound very good for the environment. So I'll scratch that out. Hiding old buildings, um, I don't think the environment cares about that. Making new habitats for plants and animals, definitely yes, that's a good thing for the environment. Uh, by providing a resting place for migrating birds, I think yes, that would also be helpful for the environment. And by taking oxygen out of the air, <coughs> trees usually give out oxygen um, when they carry out photosynthesis, usually more than they take in during respiration, so yeah. That's not true either. Make sure you always tick the correct number of boxes, by the way. So two boxes, I ticked two boxes. 3.3, uh, it was suggested that 360,000 trees should be planted in the first year. And then how many trees would still need to be planted in the remaining 24 years? So it's saying 3 million, and 3 million is a three, followed by six zeros that's how many trees we need to plant in total if in the first year we plant 360,000 we just need to take 360,000 away from 3 million that should give us our answer so I've bought a calculator today which should help us so 3 1 2 3 1 2 3 minus 360,000 gives me 2,640,000 so this is acceptable in standard form as well. So I'm going to give my answer as 264, oh sorry, 2,640,000. If you wanted to do 2.64 times 10 to the 6, that would have been fine as well. <clears throat> so if the council planted an equal number of trees in each remaining year, how many would they have to plant? So we've got 24 years left. <clears throat> and 2.64 million uh, trees to plant. So we do 2,640,000 divided by 24. Again, if we'll pop that into our calculator. 2640, 23. Yep, that's good. Over 24 gives us 110,000 every year. And then don't forget to write the answer in the little space here. <coughs> so question three continues. Uh, council says this will improve biodiversity. Um, and biodiversity is just the variety of different species of organisms in an ecosystem. So that's just something you'd have to learn. Um, 
suggests one other way that the council could increase biodiversity in Manchester. So you need different species, different types of organisms. So you could reintroduce plants or animals that no longer live in Manchester. You could also plant new trees or plants. Anything sensible there really, that's not, uh, not too tricky a question to answer. Our next question is about, uh, sorry, question four is about contraceptives that are used to prevent pregnancy. Uh, and we have to match the device to how it stops you getting pregnant basically. So our first one here, this is the contraceptive pill and that contains hormones to stop eggs maturing. The implant also contains hormones to stop egg mature, eggs maturing but <clears throat> that works in a slightly different way. Uh, the next method is an IUD or a coil, because it's got a coil attached to it, um, stops the embryo implanting into the, nu into the u uterus down here. And finally we have a condom and that prevents the sperm reaching the egg in the first place. Like that. Next <clears throat> we have a, a pie chart that shows us the percentage of people who use different types of contraceptive in the UK uh, aged between 16 and 49 years. So if you just look at the pie chart you can see that half of it, 50% is taken up by the condom on the pill because we've got a straight line down the centre of the circle here. Uh, and the rest of it is no contraceptive, sorry, contraception other and IUD. So what we have to do is take away the 21% and the 6% from the remaining 50. So 50% to start with, take away 21% and the 6%, which is minus 27%, 50 minus 27 gives us 23%. So 23% of people are not using contraception. And question 4.3 ties quite nicely into that. It's asking us why these people aren't using contraception. So most obvious one, they're not having sex. They could be trying to get pregnant. or already be pregnant and they could also have passed the menopause, be past the menopause where they're no longer capable of having children. <coughs> Next one is a full marker. So it gives us some information about the different types of contraception and we basically have to have a look at that and we have to decide what's an advantage, what's a disadvantage for each one of these. So we'll start off with the combined pill. Um, it's, it's very effective. It's easy to take. And it's free on the NHS on the National Health Service, which is good, doesn't cost us anything. Uh, D, disadvantage, uh, it causes headaches and side effects. And you must have a good memory. You must remember take it. Uh, your condom is the next method. Uh, advantages, so you only need it when you have sex. Mm, 
no side effects. And it's cheap. Disadvantages are not very reliable. And it's difficult to use. And the last one is sterilization. Which is good because it's 100% effective. However, it can't be reversed or may not be able to reverse it. And you do have the risk of surgery, which is always, always has risks with it. So question five is about ecology again. <clears throat> and the first part asks us to give two abiotic, which means non-living factors, which are going to affect the growth of plants on a school playing field. And then we have to say why each region, uh, each factor is going to affect those plants. Uh, the first one is probably light intensity was a good one to start with. And that affects plants because plants need light for photosynthesis. Uh, another one could be water or moisture. Again, it's water needed for photosynthesis. You could also talk about uh, temperature again because temperature is a limiting factor for photosynthesis. You can also talk about soil pH as well because uh, plants need the correct soil pH to be able to grow in the correct conditions. <clears throat> so next it describes an experiment. So students are carrying out a study of ecology on the playing field. They want to count the number of or the, count the population of ruby tiger moths uh, and they used a trap to catch the moths and then they could count them afterwards. So they had an ultraviolet, a UV light, which would attract the moths at night. You'd have, then have a plastic funnel for the moths to crawl down. You'd have the outer casing of the trap and inside you've got cardboard egg trays so from egg cartons that your moths could settle on and hide in. So they simply set up the moth trap in the playing field, left it for several days with the light on, then they took the trap to the laboratory, removed the egg trays and then counted the number of ruby tiger moths. And then after they'd done that, they released them onto the playing field. So no moths would have been harmed. Um, suggest some equipment that you might need to do this. Um, you're not going to need an electron microscope because that's just for looking at incredibly small things. What you might need is a hand lens or a magnifying glass so you can look closely at the moths to make sure they are actually ruby tiger moths. So I'm going to take that one. And you'd also need a book, a moth guide, which would tell you which moths are which. So I'll give that for a tick. Um, we're not trying to measure the distribution of population like we would with a quadrat or a transect, so we're not going to need either of those. Uh, so just one reason why the moths were counted in the laboratory. Um, obvious one would be, say they didn't fly away. Uh, so just one hazard in using the moth trap, um, you could, your eyes could be damaged by bright light. Or UV light. You could also burn yourself on a bulb. And then we have to look at the precautions that we take to minimize this risk. So for the eyes, you could wear eye protection. So sunglasses, goggles, anything like that. Or for burning yourself, you could wear gloves when handling. 
so your precaution has to match your hazard there's no use talking about your eyes getting damaged and so then say you're going to wear gloves because that doesn't match up very well <clears throat> the last part of question five shows us a nice picture of the caterpillar from a ruby tiger moth uh, and it's asking us why they have very few predators so as you can see from the picture they've got stiff spiky bristles which would make them very unpleasant to eat Question five done. Question six is about the human nervous system. We have a ball being thrown towards a boy. Uh, as the ball is thrown, information passes along the pathway to allow the boy to catch the ball. So we're basically looking at a reflex arc. Uh, draw one line from each action to the correct pathway, uh, correct part of the pathway, sorry. So we have the action. So the retina cells in the eye detect the light from the ball. So the key part of this is the light from the ball that has to change in the environment which we know as a stimulus. Uh, the impulse reaches the brain which sees the ball. So the brain, that's a coordination centre. So this one here is going to be coordinator. Uh, the muscle in the arm contracts which is the effector. And then finally the arm stretches to catch the ball. Catching the ball is the response. So we have another experiment described here. So students in a college or a school, whatever you want to call it, uh, made this hypothesis. So reaction time will increase as the time you've been awake increases. And if we just look at that statement, we can see that they're going to change The time that people have been awake for and they're going to measure the reaction time uh, and they're going to use five volunteers they're going to stay awake for 24 hours that's a control variable that's something they've kept the same uh, they're going to keep the volunteers in the room where they can study use an exercise bike or watch television as they wish uh, and they're going to provide food water coffee and tea as requested we're then going to measure the volunteers reaction time every four hours using a computer program. Um, the independent variable is the thing that you change. So as we saw from the hypothesis, it's the time awake. So how long you've been awake for. Uh, next, students use a computer program to test reaction time. Uh, describe one other method that can be used to measure reaction time. Uh, you've probably all done this in your science lessons. Uh, you simply use a ruler. So one student holds a ruler just above the hand. Of another. And drops it without warning. You then measure how far it falls before they catch it. Uh, you can then use a reaction time table to convert the distance to a reaction time. Um, on to 6.4, um, if we were to do this at school, we usually use the method that we've just described, 6.3, uh, because the equipment is cheap Uh, we have lots of it available and everyone can do it at once. Yeah. <clears throat> 
so we have a bit of data analysis to perform um, on the students results here so these are the five volunteers they had um, and they tested them as they said every four hours they've recorded their reaction time calculated a mean for all of the volunteers and put it into that right hand column and the first thing that they're asking us to do is calculate uh, value x in table three so that's the that's the mean time for the volunteers who'd been awake for 16 hours so to do this we need to add together all the values and divide by how many there is so we've got five values so we're going to be divided by five so we have 0 0.44 plus 0.49 plus 0.83 plus 0.27 plus 0.75 all divided by 5 of course that's how many we have uh, and just to be on the safe side depending on which calculator you have I'd always put brackets over the top part just so you don't make any mistakes uh, <clears throat> so we had 0.44 plus 0.49 plus 0.83 plus 0.27 plus 0.75 uh, that's divided by 5 and that gives us 0.556 and if we look at the question it's asking us to give it to two significant figures so at the moment we've got one two three significant figures so we have to round that to 0 0.56 seconds uh, describe the pattern of results for mean reaction time as the time awake increases so i'd go i'd be quite specific about this so i'd look at the data so as you can see from about zero to 12 hours there was a very little change so we could write that, so from 0 to 12 hours, little change in reaction time, and then from 12 to 24 hours, it's a different story. If we have a look here, we've gone from 0 points an average of about 0.3 all the way up to 0.9 so that's that's increased by a factor of three so from 12 to 24 hours reaction time increased <coughs> the last two parts uh, do these results support the student's hypothesis that reaction time will increase as the time you've been awake increases uh, I would say yes as overall reaction time increased uh, and if you wanted to make your investigation more valid like they're asking uh, about in 6.8 um, I'd simply test more students or test more volunteers uh, I would also um, control age or gender because you had no idea how old the volunteers were no idea what gender they were so that could have been a factor so we need to make sure our control variable was kept constant to make it valid So question seven, the last one in the paper, is about adaptation. So some, adapt some animals are adapted to survive in the very cold conditions such as the Arctic. Explain how the adaptations of Arctic animals help them to survive in cold conditions. Uh, the first, probably the most obvious one, is they have a small surface area to volume ratio. Uh, which is good because this means that less energy lost to the surroundings or heat energy or thermal energy 
And next they will have thick fur, uh, again which traps a layer of air. which again stops thermal energy transfer. Uh, they have a thick layer of fat. Or blubber, you might call it. And again, that uh, acts as an insulating layer. They have small ears, and that reduces surface area. Uh, they have white colour, which allows them to camouflage. with the snow to hide from prey or predators. And finally, they have large feet. So they spread their weight. when walking on snow.